The god of death is the spinner of fate, the patron of winter. They mark the end of mortal life, and mourners beg to them in funeral rites that they guard mortal souls as they pass into the afterlife. These are your gods. This is your charge. This week we're talking about the Grave Domain Cleric. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Geek Pantheon. I am Eric, and yeah, Grave Domain Cleric. This was suggested in a comment on one of the older videos, and now for the life of me, I can't find the comment. So shout out to you if you requested this one. That's my bad. So shout out to you. Thank you. Uh, if I manage to find it during editing, I'll put it here. But if there's nothing here, then I failed in my quest. So let's talk about the Grave Domain Cleric. So starting off from a flavor standpoint, it's really easy just when you initially think about something titled Grave Domain, that this is going to be very necromantic and, you know, death cleric-y almost. And it could not be further from the truth. If you are considering doing a cleric who healing is the primary function that you want to serve, obviously from like a meta standpoint, the life domain is going to be one of the best routes that you can go. But the grave domain has some aspects of it that you shouldn't sleep on. From a utility healing standpoint, this is a very, very good subclass for the cleric at keeping your allies alive. So we're gonna get into the additional spells that you get because of this domain and the class features. And then we're gonna talk about playing it as we go through those, through those features, role playing it and DMing for this subclass in your games. So let's get into it. Okay, at first level, the two spells that you get, and I'm not gonna point this out every time I go through spells that you get a level, but I really like from a design standpoint, the intention of the spells that you get because one is very negative. It's a detractor, it's harmful. And the other one is restorative and gives life in some capacity. And so I like that balance showing that as a character, you are right on the edge of life and death. And that's where your character resides. So at first level, you get Bane and False Life. For those of you who don't know, you can target up to three creatures. They have to make a charisma saving throw. And if they fail, for the next minute, concentration. When they make an attack roll or a saving throw, they subtract a D4 from that roll. So yeah, that's that's really good from a deterrent and keeping your allies safe from a uh, aggressive <laughs> standpoint. You're, you're making other things have a harder time hitting or saving against uh, the attacks of your allies and thereby preventing them from taking damage. The other one is False Life, which is restorative for yourself, where you get 1d4 plus 4 temporary hit points, and it lasts an hour uh, after the casting if the temporary hit points last that long. So, yeah, this is very good. Like, it's, it's a detraction, and it's bolstering yourself with necromantic energy. You're pulling from the forces of the grave to bolster your own life force, which, yeah, thematically makes perfect sense. Next big thing is at first level, you get a class feature called Circle of Mortality. The first aspect of it is when you are rolling dice as part of a spell to restore hit points for a creature that is currently at zero hit points, then rather than rolling, you just use the max number on the available die. So if you're rolling 2d8, you get 16 automatically, which, yeah, it's it's potent and it's powerful, but it's not so potent and powerful that it uh, dissuades your cleric from healing you before you're at zero hit points. I saw some complaints as I was researching this subclass and some people saying that this felt lackluster and maybe doing like 2x, uh, like doubling whatever you roll or max number times two. And at that point you're getting into if... I have an ally that's at three hit points and I could heal them now and maybe only heal them for six or I could let them get hit one more time and then heal them up to full because 2d8 times 2, 32 plus whatever my modifier is on that. So I, I like, I, I think this is well balanced. I think it's good where it is maximum roll essentially if the target is at zero hit points. The other thing is that you get the spare to the dying cantrip 
for free, doesn't count against the cantrips you know as a cleric, and for you it has a range of 30 feet. So that's that's a really nice aspect. Normally Spare the Dying is a touch a cantrip where you have to put yourself into danger to cast it, and now 30 feet you can be at a safe distance and do it. Eyes of the Grave, is another first level class feature that you get with the Grave Domain. So as an action, you become aware until the end of your next turn of the location of any undead within 60 feet of you as long as they don't have total cover and aren't protected by any magic that blocks divination. But other than that, you don't learn anything about the creature. This one to me for an action is kind of lackluster. A bonus action, sure. I'd, I'd, I'd go with that in, in a structured combat scenario. This is pretty big to give up your action for, in my opinion. Um, I I would either make it a bonus action or allow the the grave domain cleric to learn vulnerability resistance immunities. That's that's how I would balance it, just to give it a bit more oomph, because especially at lower levels, rarely are undead creatures going to be invisible or particularly stealthy. So yeah, that that's that would be my remedy, is, is either make it cost less or add more to it. Uh, you could extend the range perhaps, like make it up to 120 feet if you don't like the vulnerability resistance immunity thing. But at, at my table, if I had somebody playing this and they understandably weren't using this ability, because I don't know if I would ever use it unless there's a very specific situation where we have a zombie that's invisible and sneaking around and it's like, okay, I've got something. It's been 12 levels, but I can finally use this. So yeah, I would, I would beef eyes of the grave up a bit more to me. It, it is lacking to a certain extent. Channel divinity path to the grave. So at second level, you get your channel divinity ability. And this one as an action, you choose one creature you can see within 30 feet of you curse it until the end of your next turn. The next time you are an ally attacks, the target, they are vulnerable to the attack's damage and then the curse ends. Okay, so a lot of discussion about this. And initially when I read it, I there's a reason I, I went and sought this out. So according to rules as written, vulnerability, resistance, and damage stack. Somebody, their creatures can be immune, vulnerable, and resistant to the same thing. And so you are not, by doing this, negating something's immunities or resistances. You are negating the resistance. You're just not making them vulnerable on top of that. So essentially the way the math works is you do immunity first. So basically, if you're dealing with something that has immunity to fire damage, you use this path to the grave on that creature, and then somebody casts a fireball at it. You take the damage and you zero it out because of immunity. Then, because they're vulnerable, you double the damage because they're vulnerable. Zero doubled is still zero. You could do it in any order. You could double 20 damage, doubled 40, zeroed out, zero. Re with resistance, you have the damage and then you double it. Essentially, it's like advantage and disadvantage. You're just negating the resistance. So that's an important thing to note is you're not overriding anything. It all exists together. Having said that, this this is a good channel divinity. I like this because sure you can you can cause double damage to happen, which is huge. But there are situations where I feel like it would be tactically sound to negate the resistance of a creature. I think that is a stronger use of this channel divinity than just applying vulnerability. Obviously, doubling the damage is awesome, especially if they can somehow manage to crit. Ooh. But if you are dealing with a creature that is immune to fire damage, and let's say that, or not immune, resistant to fire damage, and let's say the wizard in your party prepared spells and the big spell that they have locked and loaded is a fire-based spell, um, then that, that kind of sucks. But you can at least make it to where they deal full damage as opposed to half damage. So yeah, I, I like this. I think it's a good use. Uh, just, you know, you need to be aware of the rules and how they all work together 
when using this ability. At third level, you get Gentle Repose and Rave Enfeeblement, which I, I really think are two sides of the same coin. I really like this pairing because Gentle Repose, you basically are preserving a body for 10 days. You are, you are heartening the physical matter that makes up the body to where it does not decay for 10 days. Rave Enfeeblement, you are making somebody enfeebled and weaker and less effective when attacking with with strength. So I, I like I like the symmetry of it. I think it works really well uh, with these two spells. Not a whole lot else to say. Uh, you know, I, I already talked about the, how they pair these up, negative and positive. So we're gonna move on to fifth level. Once again, kind of two of the same thing. We got Revivify, where you can bring a creature back that has died and they have one hit point. And then you have Vampiric Touch where you are siphoning health from a creature. So, you know, injecting life into a creature, sucking life from a creature, it works. Sixth level, Sentinel at Death's Door. So this one had a bit of a discussion in our Discord, link down below, uh, about the ability and basically a Discord member was talking about how they really like this ability and, and they think it's it's a lot of fun to use. And then some other people were pushing back that it crits are fun and they're rare and it's never really fun when cool things get negated at the table, which is totally fair. And I think it's dependent on the table. I think some tables would, wouldn't even balk at this ability. I think other tables would, yeah, be like, ah, it's, you're you're negating a lot of crits with this ability because it's it's not once per long rest. It's not once per short rest. It is number of wisdom modifier, which up to five, basically, uh, per long rest. So yeah, that, that is a lot of crits that you are able to negate. Not in the same round. It is you're using your reaction. So if the DM gets a gets a line of crits then there's nothing you can do but you know i don't know how hot your dice are but a grave domain cleric for a good stretch of time could negate every crit against the against the players so that is something worth thinking about for your table if you want to modify it because the aspect of sentinel at death's door that i think works beautifully with the flavor is the fact that when a creature is unconscious and they are attacked by an, an attacker that is five feet away or less, you know, engaged, then the hit is automatically a critical hit. And therefore they suffer two death saves. So they you jumpstart them on the way to death. So I like that the Grave Domain Cleric can negate that. They can stop that from happening by turning that crit that automatic critical hit into a normal hit, thereby only inflicting one automatic failure instead of two. So if you don't like the Grave Domain Cleric being able to negate uh, virtually every crit at your table, um, that's hyperbolic, but you get what I'm saying. If you want to do something different, then what I would do is... Either keep this ability, but change the wording to where it only works for unconscious creatures that have been attacked by a creature. Five, basically, unconscious creatures cannot suffer critical hits. That that That's an easy way to word it, because obviously a ranged attack could also roll a natural 20. So you could keep this the same and just basically add the condition that it has to be an unconscious character that's being attacked. Or, what I kind of just slipped, make your party within a certain distance, like anybody within 60 feet, 120 feet, whatever you want to pick, they are immune to critical hits while unconscious. And, and that just from a flavor standpoint works really well in that you are safeguarding them. Uh, you are the Sentinel at death's door class featured. It says it right there on the tin essentially. Uh, so I think that could work and that would negate because Critting on an unconscious person is less cool. We'll get into how as a DM to interact with this in a bit in the video when I get to how to DM for this class. At seventh level, the two spells that you get are Blight and Death Ward. Blight deals a bucket full of damage. Death Ward protects somebody from dropping to zero hit points. When they would drop to zero as a result of taking damage, they instead drop to one hit point and the spell ends. And it lasts for eight hours. So that's a good a good pairing. 
Death Ward is a very helpful spell for a cleric, especially one that, you know, you're if you have a lot of party members that go down frequently, you can pick probably the squishiest one that's in melee a lot, like a rogue or a barbarian, um, and put this on them and be like, okay, you'll be fine one time, and then I'll have to deal with you. So... Yeah, it gives you another round basically before a party member drops. So I, I like this pairing. It works really well together. Moving on. Potent Spellcaster. At 8th level, you add your Wisdom modifier to the damage you deal with any Cleric cantrip. It's fine. Deal more damage. This is a very... There's no flavor to it. It's just you're better at spellcasting. So, yeah, keeping it restrained to cantrips is kind of a bummer. Um, it'd be, it's eighth level. It'd be kind of cool if it was every spell. Uh, cause once again, you're just looking at a plus five for the most kitted out cleric here. If, if you dump everything into wisdom, plus five is the most that you're going to get at an eighth level. Five additional damage is not, I, <laughs> it's not going to break into any encounters that I designed for a, an eighth level party, but that's just me. So yeah, lackluster but fine. So the last set of spells you get at ninth level, anti-life shell and raise dead. This one is the first one that there's not really a good mirroring. Like anti-life shell keeps everything but undead and constructs out. I don't really get this spell being the ninth level option, the, the fifth level spell that you get because yeah, you're, you're, controlling life in a certain capacity, which makes sense for the grave domain. But at the same time, you would think it would be something that would prevent undead. I get, you do have turn undead just by default as a cleric, but you know, let me know down in the comments if you disagree with me, but I anti-life shell is the weirdest inclusion for me in this spell list. It just doesn't work for me. In fact, I would probably go with cloud kill instead of anti-life shell if it were me, because the other one is raised dead, which is unequivocally positive like it is you restoring life and you know we had blight before as one of the pairings so i think cloud kill would work really well it's not normally a cleric spell uh the death domain gets it but then again death domain also gets other grave domain spells so it's not like it's an ex exclusivity thing so yeah i would i would go with cloud kill i think it makes more sense from a flavor standpoint but you do you. And then you have Raise Dead. And I really think like looking through this subclass and kind of talking through it now, recording the video, I think it would have been nice at like eighth level, right before you get access to this spell, maybe include something along with the potent spell casting of cost of Raise Dead, Resurrection, like those, those spells that cost a lot of money because you're resurrecting a party member. For the Grave Domain Cleric, it's half cost because you you understand the magic of life and death or something like that. Include something like that to further solidify that their spell casting is potent, but then it's also something much more tangible and kind of exciting. Like it's, oh, because it's still, Raised Dead still costs 250 gold pieces. Like that's not nothing, but it, yeah, I, Raised Dead is great. It's a perfect inclusion, but I'm saying that you're you're getting access to the spell for free as a grave domain cleric, but it's not free. You still have to pay that big time cost. So I'd like to see something just acknowledging that these necromantic restorative spells are kind of the grave domains clerics domain as it were, but that's just me. And then the capstone ability, 17th level keeper of souls. When you can see a creature that dies within 60 feet of you, then you or one other creature of your choice within 60 feet of you regains hit points equal to that creature's number of hit dice. Can't do this while you're incapacitated. And once you've used it, you can't use it again until the start of your next turn. So this is a frequent ability. And most importantly, it is free. It's not a reaction, not a bonus action, not an action. You just do it. So that's great. Like that, that is a potent enough ability. You're not getting a ton of hit points, but in a pinch, especially at 17th level, like an adult blue dragon, which is CR 16 has 18 hit die. So a free 18 hit points that you get to choose where it goes every round is not bad, I would say. Um, as long as a creature dies, obviously. Um, so 
yeah, I, I, I like this ability. I think it works. And I think that the potency of it works as well because you don't have to use, if it were an action to do this, then buh, that'd be garbage. It'd be so much garbage. Uh, you would never use it. But the fact that it's just free healing that emanates from you because you can see the souls escaping and you can draw life force from them. Uh, yeah, I, I like it. So yeah, playing this, it's obviously very much from a role-playing standpoint, you are somebody that has tapped into the threshold of death. You are somebody who is a sentinel at death's door. You see paths to the grave. You are the keeper of souls. I mean, all the, all the class features names work uh, for the function of this subclass within the world. And I... I love this subclass for somebody that has been touched by death or has died at some point. Uh, like, I would love to see a game where the party starts off with a life domain cleric and that cleric dies. And when they're resurrected, they come back as a grave domain cleric. I think that'd be a really cool twist because you're not altering your function in the party too terribly much. You have some class features that beef up your capacity to heal people. But at the same time, you're showing a big transformation and you're showing a big change in ideals and the God that you worship and, and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's a really cool transformation. Um, in terms of DMing for it, I mean, I think that this subclass necessitates a lot of conversations with your deity and like getting messages from beyond the grave and maybe seeing ghosts and things like that. But the big thing that I kind of alluded to with DMing for this is obviously if you're doing the Sentinels at Death's Door modification that I suggested, then you're going to want to, you know, make use of that and have the enemies that the party is fighting occasionally be real jerks and attack unconscious bodies and try to like confirm the kill. That's something that like I did for a while. We were doing Wrath of the Righteous, the Pathfinder adventure path back when I was running in Pathfinder first edition. And that was something I tried for a while because, you know, you're fighting demons and it made sense to me that like demons would really go in to confirm the kill. What are you doing? Did you tell them to like and subscribe? Yes. Did you tell them to like and subscribe to the Miley and Eric YouTube channel? No. Like and subscribe to the Miley and Eric YouTube channel I'm gonna get cut. if you want to see more of this. I did that for a while because, you know, demons, it makes sense that they would go in to like confirm the kill. And it works. But it's also real mean. <laughs> like it's so I normally don't do that anymore. But if I had the modified version of Sentinel at Death's Door, where you're essentially blocking the doubling of failed save throws, then I think it's a bit safer. But so you certainly don't want to do it all the time because you might just outright kill a lot of party members and you're just kind of being a jerk about it. But uh, if you're going to modify it in that way, then make sure that it's usable. Make sure it's something that is getting used, whether it's you have really malicious enemies they are trying to confirm the kill or the enemies are using area of effect attacks that are going to the, the splash damage is going to hit an unconscious party member. But just make it worth it. If you're just using it as is, then, you know, understand and realize that the cleric, this is one of their big abilities at sixth level. And so getting to block critical hits is important to their subclass. And it's something that uh, is okay. And they're going to be able to block a lot of your critical hits. You could also tempt them, especially if you have a cleric that is in melee. If you're, if you're dealing with a grave domain cleric that wields a melee weapon, like a lot of clerics do, then tempting them with a lot of opportunity attacks, making enemies pass by them a lot and asking, do you want to take an attack of opportunity? Because, you know, if they say yes, then you don't have to worry about it. If they say no and you don't roll a critical hit that round, then it's like, ah, oh, I should have I should have attacked. So, yeah, reactions are a much more precious resource in this game than a lot of people give it credit for. And so giving them lots of opportunities to use their reaction is a good idea. Uh, I Just in general, that's a general game thing. But with this, definitely. So types of campaigns, I didn't do this with the last one, but types of campaigns that the Grave Domain Cleric would really shine in. Obviously anything dealing with the dead and undead because generally speaking, Grave Domain Clerics, their deities are going to find the undead abhorrent and terrible. And this is gonna be something that they really want to go deal with and take care of. So if you have an undead, big, bad, evil, 
then that's really going to, from a, a flavor standpoint, inject the Grave Domain Cleric front and center. This is their mission. Their God hates what's happening. Go deal with it. And so that can work really, really well. Additionally, if you're playing in a setting like Eberron, where during the last war, there was a nation that used undead soldiers a lot. This could also work really well in, in that style of campaign. If you set it in the war and you have them going against forces that are using undead creatures, it can be something that they can really play in that space and emote about how they feel about it. And I think clerics more than a lot of classes really with all the different domains lend themselves well to having a mirrored rival, having another cleric in the in the world that is their antagonist, their antithesis, like a death domain cleric works so well as a rival to both a life domain and a grave domain cleric. And so, yeah, if you're going to play with this whole undead thing and undead hordes, I would absolutely throw a death domain cleric as like one of the powers behind the undead forces and allow them to have that standoff with their dark mirror as it were. And those are my thoughts about the grave domain cleric. What did you all think? Let me know down below. Be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel. It helps out a whole heck of a lot. And yeah, thank you all so much for watching. I have been Eric and I will see you next time.